Yes. P Professor Thomas, I'm going to ask you a little more about the stage one um, decision-making process now. Um, and I'm going to ask you to look at a passage in your witness statement. Show me, could we have WITN 3824007, please? Um, and if we could go to page 29. Ah, that's different from the version I've got. Hang on a second. Yes, okay, we can pick it up top of the page. So this is in paragraph 112, I think, of, 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 of your statement. Um, it says, in general, patients were concerned about the evidence needed to establish that the PTH, post-transfusion hepatitis, was probably greater than 50% likely due to NHS blood and not other means of infection such as IVDU, tattooing, etc. All haemophilia patients who'd received factor VIII concentrate were automatically accepted as infected by NHS material. Uh, this was established by several perspective studies showing that the incidence of abnormal ALTs after concentrate infusion, both in the literature and our own study, was almost 100%. Nick Fish signed off on these cases without clinical input. Uh, and then you turn to transfusion cases and you say this, in cases of blood and plasma transfusion, we had to say that it was more than 50% likely to be due to transfusion. In the absence of GP or hospital case notes, this was very difficult. Occasionally, we had evidence of a major operation where, in virtually all cases, blood transfusion would have been necessary, e.g. cardiac valve plate replacement or major trauma resulting in pelvic or femur fractures. These cases usually involve both Professor DeShaco and myself and involve detailed consideration. In my view, this was as objective as possible. In the absence of case notes, it was almost impossible for Professor DeShaco and myself to provide this level of certainty. In many cases, all we could do was to exclude non-transfusion-related modes of transmission, such as body piercing and IVDU. Sometimes we had evidence of surgery which did not usually require transfusion, but infrequently did. This, again, required clinical judgment. Now, um, can I ask you, first of all, just to uh, assist us with understanding how you would use your clinical judgment to make the assessment of, of whether the applicant was probably infected by blood transfusion? Well, it's really just a, a second way of saying what I've mentioned earlier, uh, in so much as um, <clears throat> if, if um, you know, a, a surgical procedure or, as I mentioned, a trauma uh, were invariably um, uh, needing transfusion, uh, then that, that was, was, then we would uh, take that as given. Um, and um, the the way sh way we establish those um, th those um, precedents, if you like, was by going to the literature. So uh, I I would Google in, as I think uh, Professor Jusheko did as well. Um, you know, um, percentage of patients uh, receiving blood during um, aortic valve replacement or or during. Uh, um, you know, um, pinning of a pelvic fracture. And surgeons uh, have often, uh, and indeed uh, haematologists, have, have, have looked at series uh, where they could provide this sort of data. Uh, and where we found that, then we, we sort of moved that on to the, the group of patients uh, needing just a, a sign-off uh, without any further consideration. I mean, I, there was very little else um, uh, that one could look at um, I, there were GPs notes which um, in the main were were not destroyed after seven years which uh, seems to be the case in in hospital based uh, medical practice many GPs have, have these sort of cards where they you know uh, note down over maybe 20 or 30 years uh, what has happened to a patient um, so you know occasionally we would find um, uh, in, a, in a, a woman um, <laughs> that she had had a, um, you know, a, a major hemorrhage during um, during delivery of a child. Um, so, and, you know, we we know that uh, cesarean sections, uh, you, you know, with uh, placenta previa, previa, um, you know, often results in massive head, uh, hemorrhage. So there were little incidents like that where we did our best to 
uh, to say, well, in most cases, this would require transfusion. Um, that's what I meant by clinical judgment. What? Whereas in contrast to stage two, it was, as I say, um, it was cast iron uh, dependent on the, the uh, APRI score and the ALT-AST ratio. Well, what about cases where um, there are no medical records that, that um, uh, re revealing a transfusion, either because the records have been lost or destroyed or because they're incomplete or, um, as may often be the case, they, they, they don't actually record um, 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 the uh, administration of, of, of blood. Um, and you can't say, as a result of your research, th these are cases which almost invariably uh, uh, involve a, a requirement for transfusion. But you do know, either on the basis of what the applicant has told you or on the basis of what their GP has told you, that they had some form of surgery. H how would you approach those types of cases? Would, would th those applications be rejected if you couldn't find anything in the notes that gave a hint of a hemorrhage? <coughs> yes, in the main, uh, that would be the case because uh, I, I took the view when I was doing this by myself that <coughs> uh, that um, if at that stage there was no evidence, and it was our mandate to say whether it was more than 50% likely that the transfusion had occurred. If there were no notes and no um, evidence of the type that I've been describing, then I couldn't say that. But uh, <coughs> I know that... Uh, Nick Fish and, and I also uh, would would point out that um, the patient could appeal this, and the appeal group had a much stronger position. Uh, <clears throat> you know, they their view uh, would would be held um, irrespective of how solid it was. Uh, when I say solid, medically based, <coughs> and indeed for um, for some time uh, there was a minimum of of medical input on on the uh, appeals group. I think only one of the um, the people were, were medically qualified. So I, I took the view that, you know, large sums of money were involved. Um, the Department of Health um, were taking this out of the NHS budget, that I should, um, um, you know, uh, use my medical knowledge uh, to take out those cases where I could definitely say um, there had been NHS blood or blood transfusion and no um, evidence of, of, um, of other possibilities. Um, uh, for instance, um, you know, some, some people, um, uh, uh, there was one case where the gentleman was taking methadone, which is usually only give, given for uh, intravenous drug use, uh, <clears throat> and he, he um, argued that he'd only, um, he'd only taken non-intravenously administered drugs. Um, so, I mean, one could weed out cases like that um, <clears throat> and go through, um, in a positive sense, the ones that uh, were, um, where there was evidence of blood transfusion. And then it was up to the appeals group to, to use a much more subjective um, set of rules, <coughs> which, um, you know, they, and their opinion was final. So I thought that that... Um, that fallback position was, was safeguarded the patient's uh, interests. Should, um, on further inquiry, something else came up that I or Jeff hadn't noted. We know that um, both, <coughs> both from the documents and from um, Mr. Fish's evidence that at the the stage of Mr. Fish um, looking at it with the assistance of one of the directors, um, what was looked at was essentially. Um, medical information what the record showed or didn't show and there was no provision for example to consider and receive a personal statement from the applicant setting out their recollection of events or a statement from a family member setting out their recollection that their relative had received a, a, a transfusion um, um, whereas that material could be considered at the appeal panel stage Yes. Was there any reason you were aware of as to why that information couldn't be considered at the first stage by by the administrator and the director? Well, <clears throat> um, we we did see uh, um, cases where what you said is uh, was the case. Um, 
And um, a relative would, would say, for instance, well, when I came in to see, see uh, my husband or wife or what have you, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, they, they had an intravenous fusion um, device up, and I could see, um, sh the relative would say, and I could see a little bit of blood uh, in the, um, you know, just near to the point of uh, insertion through the skin. <coughs> and, and always, um, in any transfusion, of clear fluids, in other words, um, saline or rehy for rehydration, <clears throat> uh, there is always reflex of blood into that last one to two centimeters. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, the, that last one to two centimeters of the um, of the tubing, <clears throat> and that um, for someone who isn't involved in medicine and transfusion, <clears throat> they would take to indicate cast iron evidence visual evidence of transfusion, but it, it isn't. So um, <clears throat> we listened to everything, uh, and <clears throat> uh, Mr. Fish actually often had conversations with the person on the telephone <clears throat> to um, recommend uh, other if evidence that might be provided. Um, but um, I make no bones about it. This was an extremely difficult um, stage of the um, assessment, um, and why I uh, initially and latterly, Jeff Jashaka put so much emphasis on objective evidence that we could uh, <clears throat> bring forward for stage two payments because we were quite aware of the fact that uh, the stage one uh, process was, um, um, you know, highly subjective. Your, your statement refers um, in the um, bottom paragraph <clears throat> on the screen to. Um, how in many cases all you could do was exclude non-transfusion related modes of transmission such as body piercing and IVDU. Um, did, did, did it ever occur to you and, uh, um, or any of the other directors or um, um, Mr Fish um, to take a slightly different approach to stage one applications and look to see which was the least unlikely mode of transmission? The least unlikely. If you, if you had, if I can suggest a hypothetical scenario to you, you had someone for whom um, um, no evidence whatsoever to suggest that they had ever had a tattoo or a piercing or any likelihood of sexual transmission, um, um, which we know was, a, I think, a, a, a low risk in any event, um, um, and no evidence whatsoever to suggest intravenous drug use, no evidence of overseas medical treatment of a serious nature. Um, um, they had to have got their hepatitis C somehow. I if they could point to some form of surgical intervention that they'd undertaken in, within the NHS, um, wh why not take the approach of looking, well, which is the least unlikely that, that this 70-year-old individual married for 50 years has been infected with HIV through a drug or sexual route, or they've been infected by a transfused blood? <coughs> Well, I think that, that uh, you know, in retrospect, could have been a way of proceeding. But I, I took the view that <clears throat> this attitude could um, could be applied at the stage of the appeal. Um, and we did recommend that um, in the letter uh, that Nick sent out <clears throat> that um, that uh, the appeal process was open, and a very large number of um, of the people who who had uh, where we hadn't found positive evidence uh, for um, for involvement of NHS blood and where these other risk factors were not present, a high percentage of these did go on to appeal. So we, we felt that um, this was the stage at which that could and should happen. Um, <clears throat> and we, uh, uh, at every corner really, um, tried to uh, do the best by the patients and make sure there was some uniformity of the process that was um, was being used, <clears throat> we didn't talk to the uh, appeal panel uh, uh, in these terms. But I think um, every single letter um, would would say, uh, you know, we we can't find any uh, uh, involvement of NHS blood here, but we um, it's open to you to to go uh, to the appeal panel. <clears throat> um, so we felt that we hadn't been in. Um, you know, inappropriately, um, um, you know, we hadn't put, been putting the patient uh, to a major disadvantage, really. 
and much of the com many of the comments uh, uh, that the or the evidence that the patient came up with were of the type that uh, were c completely plausible. I mean, this business of well, I could see that there was a transfusion in place, and there was blood staining in the in the uh, in the area, you know, in the last two to three centimeters. Does this not indicate that the patient had a blood transfusion? Well, the answer is is no, but it's quite reasonable that the uh, patient would believe that this was the case, and the patient's relative would also believe this was the case. Um, and uh, as I say, uh, we we were of the view that the uh, this would then be um, <coughs> the the appeal panel could actually say, you know, well, we we think on balance there's no reason for not believing this patient. Let's uh, let's um, pass it through. Now, um, you and Professor De Shaker, do, do you think that was unfair? I mean, uh, um, there was a, a, a well-trodden track for the for the patient to continue to um, to you know uh, prosecute their claim in in the. Um, in the system, if you like, through the appeal process. Um, you um, and Professor Desheko, your area of expertise, both of you, was 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 hepatology. Um, well, and general medicine. We both did um, general medical tape. We call it where, for one day a week, usually you take all the cases that come into an acute uh, hospital, uh, and then you look after them for twenty four hours. The next day, you usually get. Uh, a specialist to look after them, unless it's a, a more pressing concern, whether you get a cardiologist or an endocrinologist to help during the night hours. And um, but you, you you would be having to make clinical judgments about um, uh, whether a particular operation or intervention might have required a transfusion. Did, was was there ever a system in place or contemplated whereby um, other medical experts? So perhaps an orthopaedic surgeon if it had been orthopaedic surgery or a, 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 an ENT specialist if it had been ENT um, um, in, in, interventions to, to ask for their take or, or, or input. Was, was that ever considered? Uh, yes, and that's why we went, well, we didn't actually, the way of getting that bit of information, of course, <clears throat> was to look online at the literature, or look at NIH PubMed, which is a, is a, is a way of <clears throat> accessing all medical literature. And you, you could just ask, um, you know, um, percentage of patients undergoing an operation who receive blood. And it's surprising how much information of that type is in there. <clears throat> so, for instance, um, you know, tonsillectomies uh, very rarely, if ever, require a blood transfusion, whereas uh, pelvic fractures and, and uh, fractures of the, of the femur uh, do. Uh, um, you know, so that information is there without having asked, uh, having to ask one particular surgeon. <clears throat> uh, and these were series that you could find through NIH PubMed. Uh, uh, NIH is National Institute of Health, and PubMed is a public database. Um, and it would say, um, you know, uh, and you could actually uh, find the date when it was done because uh, blood requirement um, for an operation varied over time. So you could you could uh, look then when you, when the paper was found by an in NIH PubMed uh, uh, database, it would say published by so and so surgeons in the UK um, in 1983 or, or 2020. Really, so you got an idea of uh, um, you know what was happening at one particular time, and this was quite important because. Um, um, we became very um, concerned about unnecessary use of blood once non-A, non-B in the late 1970s became uh, uh, known about. Um, and <coughs> it, it, there was a, a, a mandate, if you, well, not a mandate, but a, a suggestion from most um, blood transfusion doctors that if you only need to give a patient one or two units of blood, you probably didn't need to give them a transfusion at all, and that you could... Uh, protect them from this risk. And this was only uh, evident in the more recent years in transfusion medicine, whereas back in uh, in the 1970s uh, or so, <clears throat> you know, uh, the people would, uh, or doctors would transfuse their patients with relatively small amounts of blood, uh, which probably wasn't necessary. They could just have clear fluids, which didn't carry any risk. So that's how we avoided um, the bias of, of 
go into one surgeon. Um, the NIH PubMed is a much better uh, way of doing it. If the, that research showed not that transfusion was um, uh, um, usually required in the majority of cases or indeed a, a near certainty, but that um, transfusion was not generally required but could, obviously depending upon what precisely happened during the surgery from time to time, be required, what, what would the approach be to that? Would that be sufficient, coupled with... Um, uh, perhaps evidence from medical records that there had been some form of surgery, or did you require there to be evidence, positive evidence, that most such operations would involve transfusion? Well, we were interested in a percentage uh, that required blood transfusion, because don't forget our mandate, and we were implementing uh, recommendations that <coughs> um, it, it had to be probable, which, which meant in, in legal terms, I, I gather, that it was more than 50% likely uh, that uh, any any occurrence um, um, had occurred. <clears throat> and with that constraint, I mean, and one of the reasons we went to the uh, to the um, publications in NIH PubMed was um, there, there was, you know, uh, objective quantitative data. Um, you know, a surgeon would, would like to be, uh, you know, would say, well, uh, all the... Um, uh, bowel resections that I've done, uh, <clears throat> and there are maybe 150 in a surgeon's life with one particular operation, he said, and he would have recorded uh, uh, that, and possibly for an MD or an MSC, that only 70% of these required blood transfusion, in which case we could uh, authoritatively sign off on that, but it might say, uh, you know, only 3% required blood, uh, in which case we would be uh, less... Um, likely to agree that and all the all the time um, of course uh, we knew that the um, uh, the uh, appeal group could actually say well no we find it um, you know we should give the patient uh, the um, benefit of the doubt and the appeal group were operating to different rules they were they were told that whatever they decide uh, was absolute um, we knew that what we decided uh, was going to be reviewed by an appeal board and we didn't want to uh, <coughs> be either positive or uh, over negative. Uh, uh, we tried to implement the rules as we saw them. In other words, if the definite uh, notes in the case notes of the transfusion, that was fine. <coughs> if the patient had um, a history of intravenous drug, drug use or had received a transfusion abroad, as well as one in the UK, <coughs> it would be more likely that the one uh, or the behavioral problem uh, uh, were the cause. So I'll give you an example, for instance. In, in, uh, in Egypt, after the attempt to eradicate schistosomiasis, something like, um, I don't know, 20 or 30 percent of the Egyptian population were hepatitis C positive. So if we, if we heard, as, as we did in one case, that somebody had had an operation in Egypt, <coughs> um, you know, uh, it was more than likely that they had uh, had infected blood in, in Egypt. And the other information we tried to integrate, by the way, which I should mention here, was what genotype of the virus was involved. You, you probably know from earlier people that there are um, maybe five or six genotypes, um, which is a variant um, of, of the hepatitis C virus. Uh, and the prevalence in different countries uh, is is markedly different. So if I remember correctly, um, I mean, genotype 5 is, is common in, in China. Um, um, and if the, the patient um, uh, had lived part of his life in China and part in, in Britain, um, whereas the common genotypes here are 1 and 3, <coughs> and the patient had genotype 5, we would conclude that it's likely to, on probability, to have been acquired uh, by something that happened in China. So all that sort of information um, had to be integrated uh, and a decision made with uh, a safety net uh, mentioned in the letter that if the patient uh, felt strongly that, uh, or felt at all that he'd been disadvantaged, uh, then he or she could, um, could uh, say, I'd like to go to, to appeal. <coughs> and uh, Nick would actually... Uh, 
and Nick um, Fish would actually suggest that they might want to look at the genotype and these sorts of issues uh, to see if that information could be presented, um, if it, if it uh, you know, if to, to help the patient's case. So uh, that's all I can say on that. But we recognised it wasn't uh, wasn't ideal. But combined with the appeal process, we thought that it was not going to disadvantage the patients. Uh, uh, if we were, um, um, you know, if we applied the uh, the rules as they were mandated to us. Can I just go back to the the evidence that you might look <coughs> for through the the the, the um, p published medical m material? You you gave us two examples. One of um, evidence to suggest that in only 3% of cases a transfusion for a particular type of procedure might be required. The other that um, in 70% of cases uh, the, um, uh, a transfusion might be, might, might be required. Um, did, did you need evidence of transfusions being used in more than 50% of cases for a particular procedure in order to be satisfied uh, um, without there being supportive evidence in the medical records? Yes, yes. I mean, it, it, uh, they tended to be very polar. I mean, uh, um, you know, m most operations were things like cholecystectomies and, uh, um, you know, tonsillectomies, and, uh, you know, very few and single figures would, would require transfusion there, whereas trauma, cardiac oper operations, um, you know, uh, in the early days, um, would 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 require the transfusion in the majority of cases. Uh, I mean, just to give another example um, to illustrate, um, for instance, um, more recently during liver transplantation, um, some surgeons uh, managed to do the liver transplant without the require for requirement for any transfusion, and that was related by the blood saving technique where. They aspirate the blood that is spilt into the wound, wash it, and put it put the red blood cells back. Um, <clears throat> so, you know that that's why I make the case of, um, you know, with leeway, um, uh, we try to get a view at one point in time uh, with a particular operation what the probability was. But I, I'd be misguiding people if I said well. You know, I can tell that by 49% refuse, 51% uh, uh, you know, uh, let the case go through. You know, it would be plus or minus, you know, uh, maybe 10 or 20%. And I could justify that in my own mind by the fact that uh, three or four other people would then look at it at the appeal process. We can take that down. Um, Mr. Fish accepted yesterday um, that there might be three um, problematic consequences of, of pinning too much faith on the appeal process um, and I just want to explore those with you and see whether you've got any comment on it. The first m might be that some people very ill with hepatitis C um, uh, for example uh, suffering depression, suffering brain fog um, and, and, and the like m might not go to appeal they might feel there's no point they might feel too ill N not all refusals were appealed and and we the inquiry has seen examples for example of someone who, who who had dyslexia and felt that he just couldn't go through a further appeal process so would you accept that that would be potentially a problem that some people might just give up at the first stage oh yes i mean undoubtedly uh, that, that could be a possibility but um but I, I would imagine that's quite rare. And most people, I, I don't have the figures in front of me, but a large proportion of the patients did go through to appeal, having been initially uh, turned down. The second potential problematic um, consequence of, of uh, pinning one's hopes on the appeal process would be it's requiring people who, as I say, may already be very ill, debilitated, um, uh, um, to go through not just one application process, but to go through a second process as well, which might in itself take a toll on them. Would you, would you accept that? Yes, I would, of course. But I think it's worthwhile looking at the figures uh, that you have later on in your uh, data. I think you say there's 6,712 patients who applied for a stage one application, approved by at first stage 
5,529, um, you know, which is 80%. So, you know, uh, not not that, you know, we, we you know, waved through uh, a large number. Um, and uh, whenever um, uh, the issues of patient feedback uh, uh, were put before um, either the Skipton or the Caxton, <clears throat> it was always apparent that, um, that uh, complaints were looked at very carefully, but nobody ever looked at the proportion of patients who thought their case had been handled very, very well. Uh, and that's 80% according to these figures. Uh, and, and I think the figures of um, stage two applicants that, that um, thought that they, their case was handled quite, quite well, or even very well, um, you know, was high. Um, so, um, you know, I, I wouldn't want you to um, present the, the view that, uh, you know, the system was absolutely uh, uh, useless and rough, rough riding over, over people's uh, views, really. I think that would be wrong. Um, um, we're simply trying to but there, uh, undoubtedly there are holes in the system there's that you know uh, uh, less holes in the stage two process so the doctors were involved in designing uh, not because we're any better than anybody else but but the stage one was almost an impossible task and when you add the special care mechanism to it um, uh, you know it became a, a, a terrible situation so we uh, dr. Maine who was involved uh, uh, when the uh, was transferred to the uh, NHS business uh, with me, uh, we, we took the view that if the patient's GP and, uh, the, the, or, the, and or the hospital doctor said that the patient's depression and, and brain fog uh, were due to hepatitis C, we said, who are we to say, again, say that? And we signed all those off, uh, probably to the uh, annoyance of um, whoever had to pay the bill. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we, we had to work with a mandate, uh, um, we uh, had some input into deciding who, who got what, in other words, what the criteria were. Um, <clears throat> but if, if uh, some criteria were put forward that uh, we couldn't operate, um, however much goodwill we put into it, uh, um, you know, what could we do? We, we, with the special care mechanism, we waved through most people. Um, and that was partly because of our own experience, because... <clears throat> Both um, Dr. May and myself and Jeff were fully engaged in research into viral hepatitis, particularly this type, and we always um, uh, tried to bring to um, the, the table uh, the most modern research, which often resulted in us changing our view from maybe five years ago. Um, so um, we tried to keep it up to date. We did the best we could and recognized that it was far from foolproof. But we didn't design the system other than the stage two system. Can I just ask what um, the, the, your policy or approach was in <coughs> relation to cases where there was um, some evidence or suggestion of intravenous drug use? Um, Mr. Fish told us yesterday that effect, he was told when he was learning the job, essentially, that that would always be a more likely route of transmission and transfusion, and, and, and that was then effectively his approach, so that intravenous drug use cases would be rejected. Um, did you have many, uh, much involvement in cases uh, involving suggested intravenous drug use? Well, I think the background information to that is that if you look at populations of uh, patients who are intravenous drug users, uh, um, then you'll find that um, it's virtually... 100% have hepatitis C. Um, so if there was a, a, a well-validated uh, history of um, intravenous drug use, you could, you could virtually um, be certain that, that that was the cause of their hepatitis. So, I mean, the other figure you need to know is that of the total population of hepatitis C cases uh, that, that uh, Health Protection England uh, reviewed every year, uh, although the percentage requiring it through blood or blood transfusions or non-intravenous drug uh, methods, uh, oh, maybe a decade or two decades ago, would be maybe 30 percent or so were due to transfusion. But in in latter years, it's virtually virt everybody uh, greater than 95 percent are due to intravenous uh, drug use, um, 
and it isn't sufficient when you're trying to elucidate the story of the drug use is uh, to just ask the patient in a clinic uh, once did you use drugs nobody wants to admit that but uh, one of the aspects of being a, a doctor uh, and a lipid doctor interested in viral hepatitis is you you soon learned that you had to gain the patient's um, um, confidence and you 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 know, uh, on the first consultation, you might ask if you use drugs, and they would say no. But uh, after four or five uh, returns and follow-up clinics, they would say, well, actually, as a student, uh, once I did use them. Um, and, um, you know, as a, as a, just once uh, is enough. Um, because, of course, who... I'm digressing now, I suspect. But, uh, you know, when you uh, are at a party and somebody says, would you like drugs... Um, uh, I mean, who who is offering it? But uh, somebody selling drugs who will have been using themselves, so they are almost certainly um, um, giving you um, a needle system because you, you, you your mother doesn't give you a needle to go out with when you go out to a party. Um, you will be actually using a drug provided by somebody selling drugs, and you will become infected. So. Um, uh, almost synonymous with hepatitis C outside the context of blood transfusion, uh, a positive result is uh, indicative or highly likely that that patient at some stage, past or present, has used drugs. And that's why that, that what Nick Fish said, um, I suspect, why he said it. So um, the, um, I understand that was the policy and approach of the Skipton Fund. Did you yourself have involvement in deciding IVDU applications, stage one applications, as far as you can recall? Or, or were you generally only called in for review um, when there were clinical judgments to be made? Oh, no, we, uh, I was involved in, in judging uh, stage one, yes. Uh, I, but but were you involved in rejecting applications on the sole basis that IVD, there was evidence of IVDU? Uh, certainly some. I don't. I don't know whether it was uh, all of the ones I saw, but uh, certainly some. But don't, don't just go back to the figures. Six thousand seven hundred and twelve stage ones, of which five thousand five hundred and nineteen were passed, or twenty nine uh, were passed through. Um, you know, no, just on the basis of the paperwork. Um, so <clears throat> we were all focusing on. Uh, you know, I think it's it's fourteen hundred uh, of the cases, which is less than twenty percent. Um, uh, where one had to decide uh, on the basis of um, no, no written evidence of, of blood transfusion what the other possibilities were. Um, and that's where Nick would look at them first, then uh, I would, and then uh, on occasion all three of us would, would have looked at it. Um, and it, it, you ended up by saying, well, um, <clears throat> you know, it's a possibility that there was a blood transfusion, but we quite, can't be certain. Uh, let's pass the ball to the... Um, to the um, appeal group. Um. Can, can, can I ask you next about another category of cases? Um, so so th these are cases where the infected person was deceased. We've looked already at the, the issue about the um, trying to determine uh, cirrhosis for stage two purposes. But if the question was, um, for example, for the purposes of, of a bereavement payment, um, whether hepatitis C made a cause or contribution to the death. Um, were, were you involved in, in assessing those applications? Whether, whether hepatitis C was a cause of um, contributing death. to death? Yes. Um, well, I'm sure it must have been, um, because that, that would be, um, you know, I mean, I think probably uh, Nick Fish and uh, Jeff and I would all have discussed those sorts of cases. Uh, and that's why, in the end, uh, we came up with that uh, formula that I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, where um, the the um, mortality rate of mono-infected and, and Jew-infected people, um, which I think was in Nature or something like that, a highly respected journal, and that provided wonderful data, um, which allowed us to come up with a formula. Um, um, Going to move... Now to the Caxton Foundation. Um, you were involved with the Caxton Foundation from 2011 onwards. Um, but 
I think this is right. You, you didn't sit on the National Welfare Committee, so you weren't involved in decision-making about individual grant applications. No, no. Uh, I, I was allocated to the Audit Committee, which um, uh, a gentleman called Thomas, uh, another Thomas, uh, uh, and I um, sat down once a year uh, with the audit um, company. I've forgotten who they were. And just to make sure that um, it all stacked up, because... Um, Following the fraudulent episode that occurred in the, I think I've forgotten that which one that was the, the McFarlane Oscar. Yeah. So it was Skipton uh, Fund. We were all, yes, we were all aware of um, the need for audit. So, uh, and it was apparent that I I had medical knowledge, but not much else that was useful to the Caxton. So I I didn't. Uh, then I then got transferred across to to Skipton. So in, in terms of your involvement with the Caxton Foundation, is, is this right? It, it largely involved just attending the trustee meetings um, and contributing yes. to general discussions about policy. Yes. Um, how often um, were you uh, called upon to provide medical information to either employees or, 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 or your fellow trustees at, at Caxton about hepatitis C? Well, when um, um, when I was um, appointed to Caxton, um, um, I was conscious of the fact that I didn't have a heck of a lot to contribute, as I say, because uh, it was uh, social uh, aspects and Department of Work and Pro Work and Pensions who were involved. So I offered to give a, a, a presentation, really, on on um, really a bit like uh, the thing I prepared for. Um, Penrose, uh, and I think you've cited in some of your paperwork. Uh, I had a nice set of slides for that, and um, so I did a, a presentation. And when uh, Jeff Shaker joined us, he he updated that um, on on um, the newer methods of treatment. Uh, so, you know, we we were looking um, in the context of Cax, Caxton, <laughs> Caxton and Skipton as how we how we could contribute really. Um, can I ask you to look at one set of minutes? Uh, it's at um, CAXT 50109 underscore 105. There's something wrong with your number of zeros. Is it? Oh, I've got too many zeros in. CAXT 40109 underscore 105. Thank you, sir. So the, these are the um, minutes um, of a, a meeting of the board, 1st of November 2012, and, and we can see that, that you're present there. If we go to the third page, please, show me. Um, we can see there's an overall heading regular payment scheme, and then if we go just a little further down the page... Um, we can see a paragraph beginning, Professor Thomas suggested. So Professor Thomas suggested a plan to contact the 12 to 15 haemophilia clinical specialists in the country to help advertise Caxton to their patients. It was noted that not all these patients would be eligible, but it was a worthwhile starting point. The board agreed that Professor Thomas should discuss this with the ICEO to further inform the communication strategy. Um, now, we, we know from other material we've looked at, Professor Thomas, that one of the issues for Caxton was it had a relatively low number of registrants in the early years. Fewer people were applying to be registered and to receive assistance from Caxton than had perhaps been expected. And an issue arose for the board about how to make people more aware of the existence of the Caxton Foundation. Um, and this suggests you'd, you'd suggested making contact with um, uh, perhaps haemophilia centres or haemophilia specialists. C can you recall whether that was taken forward? Uh, I see. What does ICEO stand for? Um, That's the bin, maybe interim chief executive officer. It is, yes. Oh, interim chief. Was that Jan uh, Barlow? It was, there was a temporary officer after Mr Harvey stepped down and before Ms Barlow was appointed, there was an interim chief executive and that's what that refers oh. to. Yes, I, I I don't recall um, 
what happened as a result of that. But the reason I said that was that I was very impressed through my work at the Royal Free, uh, in, with Professor Kern Kernoff particularly, who, who tragically died, um, of how um, integrated uh, a national structure, the, the haemophilia specialist um, uh, grouping was. Um, and um, if you wanted to reach specifically the, the haemophilia population, uh, then that, that would be the vehicle for doing that. But I didn't have any um, suggestions as to how you would meet, um, uh, how you would reach those that had had uh, uh, blood transfusions or blood products other than um, factor eight or nine concentrates. Uh, but, and I think that was the challenge to the system. Um, that group of people um, were, um, um, you know, the only only way of doing that would be th through the blood transfusion service. And I, I guess that, that was the look back uh, uh, service or, or study that was done. Uh, I don't know where it was in relation to this, whether it was before or after, but um, that would be the only way to, to do that. Um, the other thing that was discussed at this meeting, oh, if sorry, I remember correctly, put that back up. of course, uh, the other thing that was discussed was, uh, um, you know, how much there was a need for this, because uh, there were several programs on the television, Panorama and the like, uh, and I don't think there were many people who had had a blood transfusion in the UK who hadn't seen one or other of these uh, uh, one or other of these programs. Uh, uh, you might say, "How do I know that?" I don't know that, but I think um, you know they they were shown on on prime time TV uh, many times. So I wasn't quite so concerned about that. D did you have any understanding from colleagues in the in the world of hepatology? Um, any understanding of how well known the existence of the Caxton Foundation was? I, I think the um, uh, the hepatology nurses uh, uh, served a very useful function. Actually, they they uh, got to know the patients very very well. Um, um, and I'm talking now about the non hemophilia patients, the ones I was talking about earlier, <coughs> um, and the hemophilia um, services in in the specialist centers also had a very close relationship with their patients because they were patients from, um, you know, from a few years of age right through to, um, to um, adult life and, uh, and uh, old age. So, um, and these nurses, I think, uh, um, the haemophilia service developed this first, but uh, one of the things uh, I helped develop was, uh, was the formation of hepatology nurses and uh, we employed several in our unit uh, at uh, St. Mary's, and the, these people uh, certainly raised the attention of the of the patients to the Skipton and uh, to the Caxton. Uh, more more the Skipton than, than the Caxton, I think probably, um, and um, would help the uh, the patients fill in the forms because uh, uh, a hepatology nurse was uh, able to do it uh, as well as the doctors. We can take that down now. Um, can, can, were you ever asked to provide advice to the Caxton Foundation about the impact of the various different treatments for hepatitis C and, and in particular the impact upon an individual's ability to, to, to work and earn a living during treatment? Uh, no. Um, <coughs> um, uh, I can't remember what was in the slide set that I used, but... Uh, Jeff Tushaker actually gave a, a, a lecture when he joined, which was at 2015, 2015, 16, sort of a time. And he had uh, uh, masses of data really on, on the results with the various drugs. Um, I'm not sure what else he included in that from memory, I'm afraid. Um, now, you've referred in your evidence earlier to uh, the concern you had about access to the new forms of treatment. And I just want to look at the letter that you wrote to the minister on that issue. It's WITN 3824008, please show me. And we can see it's dated the 1st of November 2014. 
Um, uh, it's from you, and you say, Dear Minister, I'm writing as a member of the Caxton Board and the Medical Director of the Skipton Fund, both involved in supporting those with hepatitis C acquired through receiving infected NHS blood or blood products. And then you explain um, a, a little about the stage one, stage two process. Um, you say in the next paragraph, around 90 patients receiving Skipton stage one payments progress to cirrhosis each year. Once this occurs, the cirrhosis cannot be reversed even if antiviral treatment is successful. In the last few months, orally administered antiviral drugs, which are curative in over 90% of cases, have been licensed and are currently being considered but not yet recommended by NICE. These drugs stop progression to cirrhosis, thereby removing the risk of death from liver failure or HCC. The department has now has made these available to 500 patients on liver transplant lists. And I'm writing now to bring to your attention the fact that in the coming year, 90 patients receiving ex gratia Skipton stage one patients will develop ir irreversible cirrhosis, which can be prevented by rapid access to these drugs. At Skipton, we're aware of these cases and feel that you would also wish to be made aware of the problem so that you may consider whether these cases where the NHS has accepted responsibility for their HCV infection might also be considered for fast track access to these virtually 100% curative but very expensive antiviral drugs. Um, did, did you receive, as far as you can recall, a, a response from the Minister or, or from the Department of Health to, to this letter? Uh, yes, we, we did. Um, uh, um uh, of course, uh, I haven't, haven't got a copy of that, but it did. I wrote uh, as a member of the Caxton Board, um, and I took it to uh, the Caxton Board um, to make sure that um, they were agreeable to me sending this. And uh, um, and um, Jan Barlow and, uh, was the chief executive at that time, and uh, I've forgotten who was the chairman of the meeting, but they said yes, that I should send it off. And I think the reply came back um, uh, to both of us, so it should be in the notes. But essentially, what um, I think what was said was that um, they they didn't want to um, the Department of Health didn't want to give preferential uh, treatment to one group of patients rather than to another, um, and that um, all should be treated equally and uh, come through the nice system where. Um, and made the point that whilst I was saying that um, this group should be given prior access because um, you know things could go wrong um, as they went from uh, ISHAC 5 to ISHAC 6 that we were talking about earlier and detectable by, um, by um, um, fibre scan, um, the, these, um, uh, these people, um, since it was now a nice uh, recommended treatment, uh, it was mandated by NICE that they should be treated, I think, within three months. Uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't remember um, what the NICE criteria was or is. I think it is uh, that uh, a NICE recommended treatment should be available within three months. So you'll, you'll probably know that or be able to find it out. Yes. And that this would cover, this would cover uh, the, this issue. Yes, I think that was perhaps a little later um, in, 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 in terms of the chronology of events. But is this right? Your, your argument that, um, that, that perhaps there should be a fast track access because these were people who had been, whose, whose infection was the responsibility, in a broad sense at least, of the NHS, that particular argument fell on deaf ears. Well, that, no, I think the, the minister said that uh, it was covered off by the rules and regulations covering NICE. This was, uh, by that stage, um, um, uh, not yet recommended by NICE, no. Um, but, uh, well, if it wasn't recommended by NICE, then the NICE rules wouldn't be relevant. Uh, it, this was quite some time ago, and I can't remember the detail of it. And I, I you know, uh, I remember it, it didn't come about, really, is what it amounts to. Uh, I just want to ask you a little next about the, the special category mechanism um, and, and the discussions that you were involved with in relation to that. Uh, if we could go to DHSC. By the, by the way, yes. can I just say that, that that letter really followed on from the, that debate that we had earlier about what was the crucial um, uh, cutoff for uh, cirrhosis with fibre scans. And it was one of the reasons, I think, uh, uh, well, I'm fairly sure it was one of the reasons why I wanted to go for the lower level, because I thought that would be another way of skinning this particular cat. 
and would, um, you know, um, would would include that group though, or the the Ish Ishak fives, which are just the pre serotic group. Um, um, so, I'm, I'm going to uh, um, I'll, I'll just ask you to say about the special category mechanism. Shemek, I was about to give you the wrong reference. Um, I, I think they were originally referred to as an, it was originally referred to as an individual assessment model or a health impact assessment, and then became known as the special category mechanism. Um, if we can just pick it up at CAXT five zero nine four underscore one four five. Um, now, the, there are m multiple documents referring to this issue, so I don't want to go through all of them, but we can see here, um, th these are uh, parts of a meeting of the uh, Caxton Board in February 2017. If we go to the next page and look at the bottom of the page... Um, so, in the, on the penultimate paragraph... Sorry, in the penultimate paragraph, um, beginning, the Board noted we can see reference to the special category mechanism. So the board noted that CPHT, that's you, Professor, MK and JB continue to be involved with the Department of Health reference group. And then there's reference to meetings having been cancelled. The special category mechanism had been the main agenda item at recent meetings, but JB reported that progress had been slow because the criteria for this were being driven by DH's attempt to counter the legal challenges. And then there's reference to a further draft of the SCM which the group had agreed was probably the best it could be in the circumstances. Uh, and then you're recorded as saying this, HT advised that the SCM eligibility criteria were still very subjective and would be difficult to assess. Um, what, what was your concern in, in that regard? Well, this was... Uh, this uh, stemmed from the work that uh, I had done with... Uh, uh, Dan Fortin and uh, Simon Taylor Robinson looking at um, for whether the hepatitis C infected the brain and we were able to isolate from the brain um, a virus a variant of hepatitis C which um, was the regulatory element which controls replication of the virus uh, from the one we got from the brain it was different from the one that was in the peripheral blood indicating that it was a functional virus working in the brain and therefore I was convinced um, when we did SF36 studies, uh, uh, that the observation that we had made uh, with Graham Foster and uh, others, um, that depression and um, cognitive changes, what became known as brain fog, uh, were caused in a proportion of patients by hepatitis C. The virus was in the brain, and when we did comparative studies of of, uh, of uh, quality of life between hepatitis C and hepatitis B as a control, these two areas, depression and brain fog, cognitive defects, came out as significantly different and associated with hepatitis C. So I felt that we should be uh, taking um, some, uh, we should be trying to dissect this away from um, the large proportion of patients uh, who have depressive problems and even cognitive abnormalities in the general population and related to hepatitis C. And, and it would be impossible to um, differentiate these two. Having set up objective criteria for stage two payments, which I think in retrospect have shown to work quite well, and worked through the time with stage one and um, found it very difficult to be objective um, in this group, then to add this uh, to it, uh, a special care, a special uh, category mechanism, which allowed um, uh, an additional payment, a significant payment, for people who had depression and cognitive abnormalities, would actually mean that virtually everybody would have them, and, and it turned out to be the case. Virtually everybody applied for this. Um, if you wanted to be cynical, uh, assuming that. Um, they were, they were depressed and assuming that uh, their depression was related to their infection. Not unreasonable, you may say. But um, a significant proportion of people, of course, uh, 
uh, in the general population have, have depression, and it's reasonable to assume that this proportion of people with hepatitis C uh, had the problem before hepatitis C uh, infection occurred. So I, I, I didn't relish the fact of trying to make this work, to be honest, and I, I wanted uh, the reference group to try and work, for, work towards more objective ways of, um, of, um, of um, dissecting out whether these problems were related to hepatitis C or not. Uh, and they weren't forthcoming. Um, so yes, I wanted the SCM to go through, but I didn't want it to be another situation where um, we really couldn't define the group where it was due to hepatitis C. So when the um, NHS business group took over and this um, SCM was put into effect, uh, um, Janice Main, a colleague of mine, and I used to go into Skipton House before the group, uh, the NHS business guys, took all this up to Newcastle. We sat down and tried to um, look at hundreds of these cases coming through and we decided we couldn't differentiate them and that if the GP uh, or the hospital consultant or a nurse said that this was, uh, well, they were given three choices. It was improbable it was related to hepatitis C, which I think only about three people ever ticked out of hundreds. It, it's possible and probable. So we gave everybody where it was said to be possible and probable uh, the tick uh, for the payment because we couldn't say one way or the other. Uh, if you like, uh, you may say we learned from um, from our previous experience with stage one. You know, in this subjective environment, you have to assume that the primary care physician, the GP, or or the or the consultant or nurse uh, involved in the hospital care of that patient, would be in the best position to assess the patient. And if they said it was probable, then they their payment should go through. But I. You know, we'd already given out very large sums of money, I think over 300 million. And I, and I, I felt that we should try to be as objective as possible, but this was impossible. So I felt at least I had to say uh, at the reference group that this was the case. Um, but I didn't have a better, better suggestion, really, um, of how we to differentiate. Uh, and then the... The reference group, as well as considering the special category mechanism, I think considered other um, aspects of, 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 of what the new um, business services authority scheme might include. Just, just before you go there, can I, can I ask this? Uh, how did you judge being related to hepatitis C? Because being related to may mean a number of different things. Yes, I take your point. It may be causatively related, or it may just be associated with. Um, um, and if well, causatively rela related, it may not be the only cause, but it may be a contributing cause. So it would be irrelevant whether the patient had depression and uh, cognitive problems beforehand. Uh, if, if hepatitis C uh, could make it worse, then that would be enough to, to make the payment as well. That, 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 that would follow legally in, in, a, in a case in which uh, there was a, a question of whether the condition for which compensation was being sought had been caused by what is generally a multifactorial condition. I think later on I, I mentioned Koch's postulates, uh, uh, which um, I think Koch was a German infectious diseases um, or epidemiologist. And Koch's postulates say that before um, 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 uh, an infectious agent can be um, thought to be um, causatively related, which I appreciate uh, uh, so that this is different to what you're suggesting. You're just saying it could be ex ex exacerbated by hepatitis C. I, I think the, the, the expression that I, I would use was caused or contributed to. Right. Well, Koch said that uh, for an agent to be causatively related, it should be found with the uh, uh, the disease or the symptom, and when the when the virus or bacterium or, or fungus, whatever, uh, is cleared, then the the symptom or, or illness under consideration should disappear. Uh, in other words, it came on with the infection uh, and then uh, 
went away when the infection was cleared. And um, we tried to think about uh, uh, using cost postulates in relation to this particular problem because, of course, uh, virtually 100% of people with hepatitis C can be, uh, can be cured. So there was a possibility of looking at um, which of these problems um, got better uh, when the virus was cleared, in other words, the second component of the Cox postulates. And um, um, the Americans particularly um, uh, said that a lot of the, um, a lot of the um, depressive and cognitive abnormalities, which were measured by instruments called SF36, which just was a, a series of questions, um, I think there were 36 of them, hence the name, uh, and then specialist variants of that, where you could do serial measurements before and after treatment. And uh, the Americans argued that um, most of the symptoms didn't go away after uh, the virus was cleared. Um, but uh, it turns out, um, we were doing some studies with... Um, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, but it's a sophisticated system that looks at, um, uh, at various um, um, molecules in the brain. And we've found originally that in HIV uh, and in hepatitis C uh, stage one, there was a subgroup of patients who had these, this particular pattern which suggested there was a change in the brain. And um, it would have been possible to use these scans, which cost, a, I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand pounds each to do. They were a research program um, to tell whether individual patients had been uh, had the, these characteristic changes, which we saw initially in HIV, but were also present in stage one hepatitis C, um, which I think would have differentiated the virus caused ones from the um, the. Um, other causes of depression or, or brain fog uh, that, that is unrelated to hepatitis C. But it doesn't answer your question, though, uh, of whether it's causatively related or contributing to. I don't think you can differentiate those except by looking retrospectively as to whether it, uh, it got better or partially got better when the virus was cleared. Well, I, I think the, the, the magic of the phrase caused or contributed means that it covers both. So you don't actually have to differentiate between the sole cause or one of a number of causes or, contrib or contributors to a condition. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, many conditions uh, are, are caused by many factors, and of course then they, they can uh, operate in conjunction with each other as, uh, as joint causes. Yes, I take that point. Um, but at the bottom line is that we gave the SCM um, uh, payments to virtually everybody who applied uh, for that very reason. Uh, and the other group that we, we thought should be given these payments were people who, during their stage one um, illness, had been treated with interferons, which um, initially I thought wasn't justified, but experience in, in reviewing these uh, uh, with individuals clearly became evident that many people did have the... Uh, interferon related side effects which um, when when you took care of patients going through those uh, interferon treatments it wasn't surprising that their their memory had a long had a long term uh, uh, long term compromise really and also um, if they had rheumatoid arthritis or or um, um, myxedema thyroid condition these were also made worse afterwards so i changed my view uh, during that uh, that process um, you know, and uh, when the SCM issue came up, we thought that virtually anybody who'd had the interferon uh, should probably get these payments because um, there was a correlation, maybe not causative, but a correlation, uh, which, which um, uh, you know, not, might be it was related to, um, albeit not, um, not in the Cox postulates way. Um, so, so I don't know whether that's helped at all, but... Uh, if it assists, and so we'll no doubt look at this when we look at the current schemes in May, but the current special category mechanism application form, which I picked up this morning, poses the question in this way um, of the clinician or nurse, in your opinion, how likely is it that your patient's mental health problems are attributable to their hepatitis C infection or its treatment or effects? It's the same question. It is. 
um, although the four potential answers are not likely explained by other causes, possible, highly likely, and definite. And there doesn't appear to be a box for likely. Um, but that's a question for the future rather than for Professor Thomas. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but just before we break for lunch, Professor, is I just have... To ask, is it possible to ask what proportion uh, are getting SCN payments? I think it's virtually 100%, isn't it, of stage ones? I, I think we'll be in a be better position to know that, um, Professor Thomas, oh, okay, when we sorry. examine the evidence in May. Uh, I've just got one further question about the uh, um, uh, reference group discussions, not on the special category mechanism, but on a different aspect of the discussions. If we could just look at DHSC 00046884 underscore 020. So you'll see it's a reference group meeting 16th of November 2016. Um, and if we can, uh, so again, there's a discussion about the special category mechanism. We're not going to ask you further about that. If we could go to the last page. We can see there's a, um, the, the last heading is about the policy for the £10,000 payment of the bereaved. Um, and then it's uh, said... I, I think it's probably to the bereaved. The yes, I think it probably is to the bereaved, yes. Um, reversed to OT. Um, and then it says in paragraph 12, second sentence, for the purpose of the proposed policy, the intention is that you qualify as partner or spouse of the deceased registrant slash primary beneficiary if either of the following applies. And then there's a discuss uh, provision as to what, what amounts to a partner or spouse. Um, um, can you recall, Professor Thomas, whether there was any um, discussion within the, the reference group of, of widening the category of uh, people who could uh, um, receive the bereavement payment um, to, to categories of relatives beyond partners and spouses? Oh, I can't really. Uh, um, I, I ended up at these sort of meetings with so as one of the only, well, usually the only uh, medic present there, uh, focusing on those issues, really. And uh, um, I, I'm not sure I picked up on this. Um, um, no, I, I can't shed any light on that, I'm afraid. Um, we, we can later ask. On. Yeah, I think, I think um, that was mentioned. Um, did, and did that happen or did it not happen? Well, I, I'm just asking you whether you've got any recollection of discussions about it. We, we can pick up what, what then got translated into the scheme with, with the relevant civil servants. Um, no, and I, the other issue that was raised here was uh, whether hepatitis B was mentioned. And uh, I know uh, uh, the one or two people mentioned that, but I can't remember what the outcome was, to be honest. Well, you've anticipated what was going to be my final question before lunch, Professor Thomas, which was just about hepatitis B. Um, um, can I put it more generally than, than relating to specific conversations within the reference group that you may not recall? Um, work on hepatitis B has formed a significant part of, of, of your career over the years. Um, did, was the um, exclusion of people infected with hepatitis B from the Skipton Fund and Caxton Foundation something that ever came up in any of the discussions or meetings you've had over the years with the Department of Health? No. Um, I think it was mentioned at the reference group. As I say, I couldn't remember what, uh, what the outcome was. I think um, it does seem an anomaly that um, hepatitis B uh, uh, didn't um, didn't feature, and I, I felt that the hepatitis B population. Uh, and this is what I'm going to say is not really relevant to those uh, the haemophiliacs and those are receiving hepatitis C through blood transfusion, because don't forget I said earlier about 95 percent uh, of, of my patients with hepatitis C were intravenous drug users. Um, and they deserve good treatment just like everybody else. But there was a stigma attached to, to that group of patients. Um, uh, and um, my nurses and my, my staff um, gave these guys expert care, and they were very difficult to manage. And the, the hepatitis B patients uh, were cross-stigmatized, if, uh, if I could use that phrase, uh, because people didn't differentiate between hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And most people with hepatitis B 
uh, were Asian, Chinese in particular, where 10 or 15 percent of the of, of um, Chinese population were hepatitis B positive, and they had acquired it um, uh, from their mother at birth. Um, and uh, they often uh, were very um, sheepish coming to the clinic uh, because they thought all viral hepatitis was related to intravenous drug use. Uh, um, and I'm saying, uh, you know, I spent a lot of my life looking after the people with intravenous drug-related hepatitis C, so I'm not saying that they shouldn't have required it, but I did think the hepatitis B patients were left out, <laughs> if, if I'm making the point properly. Uh, um, and uh, you say, um, you know, I spent a lot of my life working on hepatitis C, but I spent all of my career, or the majority of it, uh, except for the last couple of years, working on hepatitis B. Um, and um, I think it, it, is, uh, it, it should have been um, much more to the fore in some of these uh, schemes. And some haemophiliacs did get uh, hepatitis B. Um, but the, the, the other thing to point out, though, uh, in relation to hepatitis B and hepatitis C, uh, if you got hepatitis B as, as an adult, or, or even as a toddler, as many haemophiliacs do, uh, then uh, you had an 80 or 90 percent chance of getting a circumscribed acute episode with recovery, whereas the converse was true with hepatitis C. 80% uh, uh, got chronic infection and all the downsides of, of risk of cirrhosis and what have you and liver cancer related to the chronic infection. So I think that may have been part of the explanation, although not the justification, uh, of why the hepatitis B uh, group were left out, really. But they used to come to our joint um, hepatology clinic that we ran at the Royal Free with, um, with um, the haemophilia group there with Professor Kernoff and uh, co. So I note the time, and I'm going to move on from the financial support schemes now to ask Professor Thomas some more general questions relating to hepatitis, so perhaps we could pick that up after lunch. Uh, yes, well, let, let's, uh, let's do that. So we'll take a, a break until five past two. Five past two, Professor. Right, okay, yeah.